But that leaves us with a dozen other players that are most likely going to be one and done. So we figured on the final day here, why not celebrate the great careers that they had? And we'll start with Houston Street, a guy who closed games. But to me, the thing about him was how fast he started. He was basically a ready-made all-star level closer coming right out of college. 26 innings in the minors before he came up to the big leagues was on the 2005 opening day roster. And you see those numbers right out of the shoot a 172 ERA in a full season in the majors that first year. He had 324 career saves. He actually had the second most saves all time through his age 31 season behind Kimbrell, but only nine after that. So just not enough volume for the Hall of Fame, but a great career nonetheless. Next up, the shortstops here. One of them more offensive, one of them more defensive. But when you look at him, they were actually better on the other side of the ball than you remember. Hardy was actually just 12 home runs short of being part of that group you see on the left. He had 188 homers in his career. And Peralta, I watched play for a 100-win Cardinals team that led the league in ERA. He was just fine at shortstop. Maybe not the defender that Hardy was, but good enough and better than people remember. Now, how about a couple of pitchers? These guys were both eccentric characters off the field. They had distinct styles on the field. And that probably overshadowed how good they were at their peak. Now, we don't really see this kind of quality and volume in the game anymore. These were career low ERAs for them in those seasons <clears throat> and career highs in innings pitch. So combining quality and volume there for both of them. Next up, Matty, guy from a franchise that you're familiar with, the Angels, Jared Weaver. Think back to when this network started. He was among the guys that was one of the true aces in the game. And I think this board here gives you a pretty good comparison. All of these guys, save for maybe Clemens, had similar type of careers to Weaver. Not the longevity, but at their peak were among the best players in the game and could have pitched at the top of the rotation for just about any team. Next up, Jason Wirth won a championship in Philadelphia, and he wasn't part of the Nationals 2019 season, but he did set him on that course to be a winning franchise. You look back at what they did in D.C. before the Wirth contract and then what they did in the seven years he was there. Second best record in the league behind the Dodgers, and then a couple years after he left, with mostly that same group that had that momentum from worst tenure, they get through and win the World Series in 2019. Next up, a couple National League West players. <clears throat> what you have here, Matty, guys that spent their entire career with one franchise, most years with these two teams since the move to California. So some iconic players in those uniforms, and you see on the bottom, obviously they matched up a ton. Ethier got the better of those matchups. Huge numbers versus Kane going head to head. And lastly, a trio of players that won a World Series together in 2013 with the, with the Red Sox. Lackey won with three different teams. He was great for the Cardinals as well as fourth team. <clears throat> Napoli could have won a World Series MVP in 2011, if not for Nelson Cruz and David Fries. And Jacoby Ellsbury probably had the best single season of anybody on this list, but we know it was a tale of two cities for him in Boston and New York. So these guys aren't going to come close to the Hall of Fame guys, but great careers nonetheless. An honor to even be on the ballot. Yeah, but a, what a really nice profile uh, of all those players and the impact they made. I had would never have guessed that Matt Cain, and Andre Ethier ranked as highly in games played right. and contiguous years of service with those franchises as they do. Uh, all those players, really good players. They're all depressing. I don't know about that, Harold. I mean, those guys were good players. They're going to have a hard time getting over the 5% to stay. Is it 5 or 10% to stay on the five percent to stay on. Yeah, I mean, look, I think they're all great players worthy of consideration, but uh, do voters think they're Hall of Famers? I, I don't know the answer to that, but really a nice tribute to them as well. Yeah. Oh, did you have something? Well, what, what's interesting, too, is, and I think that's the point. When, when you come up with players like that, it's not a slight or, or uh, you know, looking down on them. They're not Hall of Famers. The Hall of Fame is the 1% of the 1% that ever played. Yeah. I mean, that's just the reality of it. When you look at a list like that, and Street was pretty impressive because there was a time when Street was coming to games, it was game off. Right. You know what I mean? As soon right. as he was coming in, you knew the game was over. It was just going to be slam dunk. But is did he do enough in his career to say I'm the 1% of the 1%? And the answer is probably not. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break here and uh, talk a little bit more Hall of Fame with a different rub on it after a quick break. Uh, Drew Jones has a dad who is Trent. Welcome back to the Tuesday Hot Stove. Hey, coming up on Thursday, 7 Eastern, right here on MLB Network, a hotly anticipated show every year as we preview the top 100 prospects in the game. Scott Braun, Steve Phillips, Jim Callis, Jonathan Mayo sort through a very talented field. And if we're just going to talk about draft status, uh, in last year's June draft, second overall, 
uh, when a guy who has a bloodline in the game, who has an incredibly bright future, who is articulate, who is uh, engaging, who is talented, and who joins us on the program, Drew Jones, who's in Arizona right now, rehabbing, getting ready in a pre-camp. Hey, Drew, good morning, man. Thanks for taking some time with us. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I want to talk about pressure. I mean, I you know, watching you play <laughs> and watching the way your dad played, I don't think you've ever felt any pressure athletically. Does the fact that you were picked second overall, considered a top prospect, does it ever get in your head? Um, no, I just kind of just want to go out here and play my own game, you know. Uh, obviously, there's going to be pressure when you play every day. Um, and being a top prospect. Uh, but, I mean, I just go out here and I just play baseball. That's all I really want to do. Uh, don't let the pressure get to you. Just be yourself. Give me a nugget or two that your dad threw out your way that you kind of uh, hold on to and use as a staple from time to time. I can remember when I went away when I was 17 and my father told me, just worry about yourself. And that's always resonated because I didn't worry about the other things going on outside of me. I just worried about myself. But I was wondering if your dad might have thrown a nugget or two your way when you decided to start your professional career. Um, I mean, he just tells me to go out there and have fun. Um, there's not really much else you can do in baseball. You can't control the little things. So just go out there and have fun and be yourself. Did we get uh, did we get hoops out of the out of the system? Because I know you played a lot of basketball in high school. Is that done with? Uh, yeah, I'm done playing basketball. Uh, I gave, well, I didn't necessarily give up, but I stopped playing after the sophomore year of high school. Got it, got it. And you, you, you became a baseball only guy, or was there another game? I know you messed around on the golf course a little bit, but was, was, did it stay baseball at that point for you? Um, I mean, I've been playing baseball since I was three, so, um, I've just been playing baseball all the way through. Uh, never really had a thought of quitting. Uh, I play golf a little bit here and there, just kind of just whenever I can get out on the course. Um, you know, baseball is a busy schedule, so um, not as much right now. But, um, you know, I just go out there. I mean, I have fun playing golf. I play basketball here and there, but not – not competitively like I used to. So, so growing up around the Braves, around a big league team, I'm sure you were with dad occasionally at Turner Field. Um, was there ever a time where you got in the way or prevented somebody from doing any work because you were in the cage goofing around? Tell us about any of that. Um, I mean, I was super young when I was uh, when my dad was with the Braves, but um, I mean, I don't think I got in anybody's way. Hopefully, um, I mean, it, it's it's obviously a joy to be in the locker room with guys that he played with and guys that you look up to when you're younger. But um, I mean, it's a lot of fun just to be out, just to be in the uh, clubhouse and see like how guys train and get ready for the games early in the day. Let everybody know how you're feeling because I know you're out there and you're doing some rehab and you're in early camp, but there's no reason to think that spring training's going to start, season's going to start, and Drew's going to be ready to play. Um, I mean, right now I just started swinging, so uh, just kind of getting back into the groove of things, working through a hitting progression and a throwing progression right now, and uh, should be ready to start next season. It, it was your left shoulder, am I right about that, that, you, that yeah, you're definitely. rehabbing now? So, so your throwing should be okay? You're right, right, everything's all right in that regard? Yeah, everything's good. Uh, just kind of like getting used to putting the pressure of like just moving like the upper body and stuff like that and just getting back used to all that. But throwing's good right now. It's just mainly hitting, trying to get back into games, game-like form. What have the Diamondbacks told you about what to expect this year? So, you know, assuming everything goes great with the rehab, which it sounds like it is, uh, are you expected to start at a certain level, or is all that to be determined? Uh, I'm just kind of going with uh, the flow and whatever they think. Uh, if they think I'm not ready to go straight to affiliate or straight to rookie ball and just kind of work through um, just like live at bats with rehab guys, that's fine. But I'm just kind of working with whatever they have planned for me. Now, Drew, when you're talking about starting to swing the bat and your progression, um, let's say you're all normal, you're all good. Do you have a staple or two that's in the cage? Are you a machine guy? Do you crank it up? Soft toss from the front? What's your routine as, as far as hitting that you do every single day? Uh, hit off the tee, uh, front toss, uh, sometimes live and sometimes machine. It kind of just depends on the day and what I'm working on. Uh, if I'm trying to like work on my velo or just getting ready to like hit, uh, mainly probably machine. And then if I want to like, if I want to take like long rounds and work, and I'm working on something, I definitely just do live all day. 
So, uh, circling back to your dad, because today's Hall of Fame day, and your dad's, uh, his candidacy has been on the rise. A lot of people that are putting him on their ballots. Do you ever have conversations with your dad about the Hall of Fame? And if you do, are they conducted in Papiamento? <laughs> uh, uh, no, not definitely not in Papiamento. Uh, but uh, sometimes it comes up. Uh, I mean, we just talk about it casually. Like, if we're talking trash to each other, he's like, oh, I'm, whatever, I'm on the ballot. And I just think that's funny. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, hope, I hope he gets in uh, this year, if not next year. Um, I mean, I think he deserves it. He's a great outfielder, uh, one of the best of all time, in my opinion. So, um, hopefully he gets in today, but you never know. Well, there are a lot of people that agree with you, and there are people that, you know, aren't in the family that feel the same way yeah. about your dad's crew. Do you speak any Papiamento, by the way? I do not. I, I was never taught. I just kind of just spoke English, a little bit of Spanish, but that's just from picking up from guys around here and going to class. Well, Drew, we appreciate the visit today, man. Uh, thanks for taking some time with us. We're looking forward to the show on, on Thursday to see where you lie on the top 100 list. We know it's going to be someplace pretty close to number one. Uh, way to go, and uh, we look forward to seeing you out on the field in the spring. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good luck, Drew. Drew Jones right, joining us on the program. Fun to visit with him. He has got a bright future, that young man. You did a little research on the hoops and the golf and everything? Yeah, he, he, I think he was a guy that gave up hoops kind of gladly. But, you know, a lot of multi-sport guys, you know this better than I do because you work with a lot of yeah. kids and, and amateur players, they have a hard time being convinced to give up the other games. Well, look, it's part of what they – they do, and it's part of their athleticism moving forward. I, I'm not a, a, against a 16-year-old dude going to tell mom and dad, look, I don't want to play hoops anymore because I want to concentrate on this. But I'm also okay, okay with a 16-year-old dude that's really good at baseball saying, I want to play hoops all the way through. Yeah. This is fun for me. And you don't want to ever take away the kid out of them. If they enjoy doing something, and I understand the way the dollars are now in the draft world, and the parents might be thinking, yeah, but if you roll an ankle or something, uh, okay, yeah. great. Yeah. But this is me being 16-year-old. We'll figure that out you know, later. I, I don't have a problem either way. If they want to be safe with it, good. But I'd also say if somebody says I want to play right through, all the way up through my senior year, yeah. So be it yeah. and go play it. Makes a lot of sense. Let's uh, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, Keith Costas, if it were Jeopardy, he'd have a name for this game. What is Venus? No, 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 not Venus, not <laughs> Venus. Uh, but we're going to take a bump to break. The bump doesn't matter. It does matter. And we'll come up with a, a title for this game when we come back. How did you come up with the title? Hey.